afternoon and welcome to Thursdays with Friends. I hope everyone out there can hear me just fine. This program is brought to you by the Friends Committee on National Legislation, a national nonpartisan Quaker organization that lobbies Congress for peace, justice, and environmental stewardship. I'm the show's producer, Wesley Wolf Bear Pinkham, and uh, here's our chat for Thursdays with Friends. FCNL General Secretary Diane Randall and her guest Amelia Keegan, Legislative Director of Domestic Policy, on the topic, Love Thy Neighbor, Hey Congress. Thank you, Wesley, and I hope everyone can hear me. What a joy it is to see so many faces, familiar faces, uh, on this screen with us today um, in this really difficult time. Uh, we are coming to you from uh, our homes, mostly where we are working remotely during this time. FCNL went to telework about three weeks ago and uh, we feel blessed that we are able to work. We have a lot of support from our own staff, our IT staff and our communications staff. And uh, I am pretty impressed by how nimble people have become in using this new technology uh, to keep us connected. And that's really what we wanna do with you is we wanna stay connected to you. Um, our supporters, we have people on this call who are actively engaged in advocating with Congress. We have donors on the call who provide the financial support that keep FCNL going strong. And we have people who care deeply about um, the most vulnerable people in our society uh, who have for a long time worked on these issues. And now as we see this pandemic sweeping across the globe, uh, we all see the impact of it on um, really all of us in some way, shape or form. And yet it's people who are very low income, people who are vulnerable in other ways, people who have become low income or no income, who are in very great need. So I'm really pleased to be able to share with you a little bit today about what FCNL has already been doing in uh, talking to Congress. Um, usually when we talk to Congress, we don't say, hey, Congress, we generally send uh, messages and, and uh, make requests to them. But we uh, want to share a little bit with you about what we've been doing as FCNL, as well as how we have engaged other faith based organizations in Washington, D.C. to uh, try to assure that Congress does provide relief to people who are in deep need. So with that, I want to Keegan. Many of you know Amelia. She is the uh, Director of Domestic Policy at FCNL. And in addition to that, she carries uh, our economic justice portfolio. Amelia is very familiar with many of the federal programs uh, that provide human services and address people in need. And she'll talk a little bit today about what we're working on and a little bit about um, just how we're doing it as well, uh, given that Congress is not literally on the Hill. Amelia, thank you for joining us. And uh, can I just ask you to talk a little bit about um, uh, what has happened and where you see this going? Yeah, thanks, Diane. And thank you all for uh, tuning in with us uh, today. It, it's great to see so many uh, familiar faces and, and be with you all virtually. Um, as Diane said, you know, right now, Congress is like technically on recess, but, um, you know, the halls of Congress or even the virtual halls Congress um, have been really intensely busy. Uh, I'm sure as many of you have been following the news, it's hard to keep track of with everything that's been happening. But Congress has passed in very rapid succession three COVID-19 relief bills. And it sort of culminated in the um, CARES Act, which was a $2.2 trillion stimulus bill. And now Congress is trying to pass a, another much more narrow bill that's very focused on uh, further assistance for small businesses. And talks have already begun about a additional package uh, uh, in addition to that. And so we have an analysis of the CARES Act up on our website. I hope that you are kind of uh, checking that out. We have a lot of resources up there. But I will quickly say that kind of the third bill had some really important provisions like expanding unemployment insurance, um, to accommodate a lot of the ways in which our economy has changed in the past couple decades. It provided rebate checks and gave a lot of uh, additional funding for states and local governments. Uh, but we know that it, it missed a lot and there was a lot that was left out. 
And so we are working right now to kind of lift up all the things that really Congress needs to address and needs to um, include and prioritize in its next uh, COVID package. Um, and that really is from FCNL standpoint, we wanna make sure that they are prioritizing low income and, and vulnerable communities. I will say at this very moment, we are very intently focused on ensuring that um, the bill that's going through right now uh, this small business bill also has some additional uh, SNAP benefits and I can get uh, more into that later, but that's kind of where things stand and we've been working really hard with our partners and um, activating, um, as I'm sure many of you have gotten an action alert from us on this, uh, on this issue. Thanks, Amelia. You know, um, one of the one of the things that I think is really um, important to us right now is that we are all, I think, still trying to understand even the impact of this. Uh, we have loved ones. We ourselves have probably been affected in some ways. Hopefully, no one has been ill with it. Um, but um, the the ramifications of this pandemic and the downturn, the the, the vast numbers of people who are unemployed, um, the lines that we are seeing in food banks. Uh, probably will last for a while. We just don't know. And I mean, you have some personal experience as someone who understands marathons. And it strikes me that this we're going to be in a marathon for a while. And I just wonder if you can comment about how we are uh, positioning some of the advocacy that we're doing right now to have an impact um, beyond the time that this pandemic is having its more, most forceful effect on our society. Yeah, thanks, Dan. That's a great question. And and I will say, I, do, I have been commenting to my husband, I feel like every day is a sprint in a very long marathon because it's been, so much has been happening. But I, you know, I, I would say that there are probably three things that we're really, that we're really focused on. Um, there are a lot of things that we want to see in the next package, but I just to lift up three for you. Um, one is kind of right now in the immediate, as I mentioned, we want to make sure that this kind of narrow package that uh, increased benefits for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or SNAP program is included, right? This is one of the most powerful things we did in the wake of the Great Recession was to increase SNAP benefits. And that's because SNAP is not only our most effective anti-hunger program, but it's also one of the best ways to stimulate the economy, right? Because people spend their benefits quickly and in their local communities. Yet we've seen Congress pass three bills that have repeatedly omitted this need, this needed increase in SNAP benefits. So we are working really, really hard to get the SNAP increase as a part of the next COVID bill that goes to the president's desk. And so I would say for all of you, if you want it right after you get off, Zoom call to contact your members of Congress about this very point um, it is really important. But beyond that, I think the, the other thing that kind of touches to what you were saying, Diane, is that all the relief that we've seen in these past three bills is that, um, you know, we know that these first three bills have really focused on just the duration of the pandemic, right? And as we have seen, we have 10 million jobless claims in March. We know that this economic recession deep, and it's going to last a lot longer than the pandemic's initial spike. So, for example, like the stimulus checks, very necessary, but insufficient. And the increased unemployment benefits, a lot of those expire at the end of July, and the expanded benefits expire at the end of the year. And so we need to do a lot more to really boost the economy, to make sure we're extending unemployment beyond these dates that they expire. To make and making sure that assistance is really focused on first on low income and vulnerable communities. So that's kind of, we need to make sure that what we're doing is going beyond just the health crisis. And then I think the third thing that we're really trying to lift up is how the this virus and this recession is not going to hit all groups equally. So we're trying to be very attentive of certain populations. And the legislation that's passed so far a lot of it leaves out some of those very groups, right? Like many immigrant families, including those with US citizen children, they can't access the stimulus checks. And that's different than what we've done, say in 2008, and even with the 2017 tax credits, which allow 
uh, families to claim the child tax credit if uh, there's a citizen child, regardless of the status of their parent. Moreover, like we want to make sure that uh, immigrants can access testing and treatment regardless of their status, right? That's just a moral necessity and it's public health common sense. So those are kind of three things and we're really looking at um, how are we focusing right now, but also looking to the future bills that we hope are coming. Thanks, Amelia. Um, we have about a hundred people here with us on Zoom, but we are also on YouTube and Facebook uh, live. So we're really thrilled that so many people from all over the country have joined us. Wesley, can I ask you to remind people how they can submit a question? We have had a couple of questions already that I'm gonna proceed with that, but can you just jump in and remind people how they can submit a question if they have one? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so there's a few different chat boxes that you can choose from depending on where you're watching. If you are watching on Zoom, uh, you can press the chat button at the bottom of your screen. That'll bring up a little chat there. Our co-hosts are keeping an eye there. On Facebook, uh, you can write a comment. And on Twitter, you can also, uh, sorry, not on Twitter, on uh, YouTube, you can also write a comment um, or a question. So uh, if you have something, feel free to just uh, plug it in now and we'll have time at the end uh, to address your questions. Thanks for uh, participating, everybody. Thanks, Wesley, very much for, for sharing that. Uh, I'd like to go to one of the questions uh, and it relates to how we are uh, working with uh, certain populations. And uh, as you all know, FCNL has a Native American advocacy program. Um, uh, Carrie Colfer is our advocate in that program. And we hope that in one of the future uh, Thursday chats with friends, we'll have Carrie joining us. Uh, but Amelia, could you just speak? One of the questions really has been is about is about releasing the the resources to Native American communities because there was some concern that there had been some money appropriated, but it was was difficult to get out. Can you address that question? Yeah, so that's a great point, and that is one of the things that we've been most concerned about. Certainly, in the second uh, bill, there was about thirty million dollars that was allocated to tribes, and yet tribes were unable to actually access that funding. And in the CARES uh, Act, we saw a number of um, additional funding for tribes and for um, Indian Health Services and other kind of other uh, uh, areas that would go to help Indian country. Although we are, we are looking into this, but this is one of our big concerns is that that money has not yet been released and that tribes are still having trouble accessing that money. So that is um, something that we are certainly um, following and I would again encourage all of you. Carrie has just uh, finished a blog piece that we hope to, to get up on the blog very soon and so that will provide a lot more information on the intersection of how COVID-19 is really playing in Indian country. Thanks Amelia. Um, you know I just want to say that I think people here probably already subscribe to the Native American legislative update that uh, Carrie puts out monthly. If you aren't subscribed to that, I, I encourage you to go to the website and sign up because it's a great resource to, to be updated on what's happening in Native American communities uh, uh, overall. Um, we have a question about um, sort of the political situation with Congress. And the question actually is, what's the opposition to any new SNAP benefits or to any of these provisions that address everyone? I think we watched a um, little bit in amazement actually to see way that um, Congress came together on a $2 trillion CARES uh, relief package. And now, today even, we can read about the back and forth and some of the partisan controversy that's going on between Democrats and Republicans. Can you just comment on that, Amelia? And, um, and then also just say, I mean, of course, we are, we are working with everyone. It's our intent to talk to all members of Congress. Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. And for the CARES Act, we were pushing very hard along with a number of our partners to try and get those increased SNAP benefits in the in that bill. And there has been some really, that was one of the final uh, questions. It was that, that was still being debated up until the final moments of that bill. And so we were really disappointed that we didn't get it in. Um, you know, I think what we have heard is that there's been to increasing benefits. There's been more of a willingness to expand who is eligible for benefits, but when it comes to just giving people more um, the uh, more SNAP benefits, uh, that there's been a kind of pushback on that. Which, given the fact that like a SNAP meal is averages you know a dollar forty uh, 
a dollar and forty per meal. It's not a ton of money that we're talking about. And mo for most families, their SNAP benefits run out by the third week of the month. And so these are this is really really important. And as I said, one of the most effective things that we did in two thousand and eight. So. And generally speaking, there tends to be bipartisan support around nutrition assistance, but I think this is where more members of Congress and more senators just really need to hear from their constituents about how this is such a such a needed priority for them to, to for them to increase. So um, our friend Betsy asks a question about um, whether there you know there's there's often. Uh, concern or you know that that there could be abuse in these programs um and uh I, I, so I'm, I'm interested in your reaction to that or your thoughts about that with regard to snap uh, but i would just extend that a little bit and ask about given um you know what's happening i mean it feels it, it feels i mean i guess what i'll say is i think people are recognizing there's a sense of urgency and that um there is a willingness to uh address that urgency so I, I'm interested in what your thoughts are about this with regard to SNAP, particularly, Amelia. Yeah, so, well, in terms of the kind of what we often hear around reports of abuse of the program, you know, a lot of that really um, fallen since SNAP moved from the physical food stamps to uh, electronic benefit cards. And so we actually see now less than a 3% error rate in SNAP. Um, which is pretty phenomenal. And if you want to compare that to, you know, Pentagon or tax code, plenty of other areas of uh, federal uh, thing, I would say that's doing a pretty good job. So I just, I, it infuriates me how I see oftentimes this overarching concern about people who have low incomes abusing programs where there isn't a lot of abuse um, compared to other areas of our federal spending where there tends to be a lot less scrutiny. Um, and then I think your other point of the question, Diane, remind me. Was... Uh, just, just about, no, the, the, the fact that the, the, the sort of sense of urgency that I think we're feeling. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, somewhat, it's interesting, you know, uh, I would say that a lot of FCNL's policy is premised on the, the very idea that government is to serve the people and that um, that includes all the people. And therefore uh, it's important for us to address uh, the needs of people who are very poor, uh, people who are incarcerated, people who are living in our country who aren't documented, but still serving our country in very uh, significant ways, that, that that's part of our government's response. That should be the federal government response. And I think in some ways, we saw Congress step into that in a really meaningful way with this huge uh, CARES 2 package. And um, in fact, I think one of the concerns too is uh, someone sent a message just asking about getting that money out. Uh, I think one of the reasons why using the existing uh, federal programs that work, uh, such as SNAP or uh, the uh, Community Development Block Grants for some of the funding to address homelessness or, or housing needs, um, there is a mechanism for that funding to flow to states or to municipalities, and so that works. But um, do you know anything more about sort of the bottlenecks that may be happening to, to move this money forward? I mean, it, the bill was just voted on about 10 days ago, but uh, can you, what are you hearing uh, in the coalitions and the work that you're doing and talking to people on the Hill? Yeah, I think part of it is there is just such huge, huge need, right? I think we've all read the reports and certainly there has been a lot of traffic over the listservs and in support especially like unemployment insurance being a huge example, right? Uh, states are just inundated with claims and they do not have the resources to be able to just um, be able to, to manage that. And um, the in Congress did provide some additional uh, assistance for states administrative costs relating to the unemployment insurance system, but it's not nearly enough. And so, I mean, it, it's things like that where you might already have a system set up, but still um, they're just inundated and haven't seen this sort of level of need before. The other, I'll give another example of the rebate checks, which we were we are very pleased that 
we were pushing very hard so that people with low or no incomes could get the full value of the rebate check. And that is the case. Unfortunately, for people who did not file a tax return, they're gonna have to go back and actually file an amended return to be able to claim the benefit. As you know, like that's, that's pretty burdensome and that's gonna be hard for a lot of people, especially mm. in this environment right now, right? Where we're all social distancing, many people might not necessarily have the same sort of access um, to the internet or to different resources or even to know how to go through the process. So that's where there's being there's a lot of talk of what is the outreach and education necessary to ensure that people are able to claim those rebate mm -hmm. checks. But it's that's just another example. Amelia, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and so I say that to the people on the call if you have questions. Um, but we have a couple of questions that get to the functionality of Congress. Um, Congress, as you said, is on recess. Um, What's the mechanism by which, I mean, we know that there's been some controversy over they would, whether, whether they would allow remote voting. And at this point, it is not possible for them to vote remotely. So how is it possible for them to act on legislation um, if they don't come back? I mean, we also saw, I just saw a headline where uh, Senator Durbin was suggesting that they won't be back on April 20th at the end of the recess. And so what, what, do you, what, what has to happen in order for any kind of movement to move through Congress at this point? Right, so we are, yeah, as, as you said, Diane, yeah, and I think Senator Durbin is probably pretty accurate. I think people are very skeptical that Congress would return on April 20th. Um, right now, uh, what they have been trying to do and what they've tried to do with this kind of small, small business relief package is to move things through unanimous consent. And so for that, um, no one can necessarily object. And so that is why things have stalled a little bit we thought it might kind of run through both uh, Senate and House this week, but um, that has has not happened. So they're trying to move a lot of things through unanimous consent so that they don't need to bring back mm -hmm. the entire House or the entire Senate um, to do that. I will say just in terms of our interactions with Congress, many, uh, many congressional staff, they're still working, right? Many of them are maybe teleworking but we're still having those phone calls with them. We're still having lobby visits with them. We're still emailing with them back and forth. And they're, they're working really hard. They're working round the clock as this is such a crisis and, um, and Congress is trying to respond pretty quickly. So here's another question, which I think is a little bit tougher, but one that is deeply concerning to many people. And that is, um, can Congress or what can we do about um, the, uh, firing of these inspector generals um, and the, the potential ab abuses by the administration to take advantage of this crisis and um, where people's attention may be diverted. Have you been talking yeah. to people about that at all? I, I mean, I haven't been as uh, engaged in those circles that are concerned about that. I know that there are watchdog organizations that are deeply troubled by this. And certainly that I think is one of the reasons why um, the speaker Pelosi created this kind of oversight right. committee about how at least the CARES 2 Act was being, the CARES Act was being implemented and how that funding was being used. And so Congressman Clyburn is, is heading that up. So I think there are, Congress is trying to play some sort of an oversight role, but um, it is, uh, it is quite disturbing to see what is happening. And I would say that, you know, one of the ways that we encourage people to advocate is obviously to contact their, their own senators and their own rep on various issues. And we have a lot of tools on our website. If you aren't sure how to do that, I think most people on this call probably have done so. But another way obviously is to write letters to the editor or uh, post things on social media because, and, and tag your member, that people see those. Um, so I think that that's, a, that's an important, another important way that people can be engaged. Um, you know, uh, Amelia, we're starting to see more and more information about how much COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting communities of color. And um, I think, and we're gonna, this, by the way, this Thursday's with chat with friends, it's gonna happen about every two weeks. And, we do intend to bring uh, Jose, Agu excuse me, Jose Was onto the call in a couple of weeks, um, who will be able to talk a little bit about some of the work around criminal justice reform, jails, and prisons. 
But what are you hearing? I mean, I've seen that there are some places this is being tracked and other places it isn't. But I know we recently signed on to a letter with other faith leaders that, um, that really spoke out clearly about the, the very uh, disconcerting, well, it's all disconcerting, but the very uh, strong indication of how, how, uh, how devastating this is to uh, those communities. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And as many people are saying that while the virus doesn't discriminate, the racism in our country and our, uh, the current policies that we have mean that the outbreak and the resulting economic fallout is affecting everyone equally, right? And so um, there's been more and more data that we have been seeing that's been reported about how people of color have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And so, I mean, a lot of that is you know, people of color uh, working, more likely to be working in jobs, don't allow teleworking. Um, we have some real health disparities in this country, especially when it comes to who was insured, the quality right. of care that people receive. And that doesn't even begin to touch just our system of mass incarceration and who is policed and who is locked up. and the extreme risk that incarcerated individuals face contracting COVID-19. Um, it's true for immigrants uh, who are in detention. And so we could go on and on, but certainly um, Congress, we think Congress really needs to take account of these things in its policy response. And, and the other thing that we've been talking a lot about um, at SCNL is how COVID-19 has really shown light um, on a lot of these disparities and a lot of the problems Absolutely. that were already uh, present within our society. Thank you, Amelia. That was a great answer. And it is uh, something we'll be certainly lifting up in our advocacy on a consistent basis. We're going to need to wrap up, um, but I want to wrap up with a, a hopeful note because FCNL uh, works in the area of hope. Um, that is that is part of our business as much as advocacy is. And so um, this is a question that I think you'll have a good answer to, and I might have something to add, but well, the question was, um, what advice would you give to young folks? I think we have a pretty good example of something we've just done that was pretty inspiring to all of us, but do you want to talk a little bit about your advice for young folks? I would say, I think, I, I just be bold, be brave. Like that's what we need is really young people to step up. And I there is, people are really hungry for, for the younger generation to be able to take on leadership and step up into this moment. And so it would just be, I wanna just encourage people to just go all out and be, um, there is, people will listen to you if you speak up. And I think there's a real desire to hear the voice of what younger people are saying. So that, that would just be my advice. Where everyone wants to hear from what uh, young people have to say and can really make a powerful statement. And we, we learned that at Spring Lobby Weekend. Uh, two weeks ago, FCNL had its Young Adult Spring Lobby Weekend and we were able to move it from a 500 in-person event to a 500 virtual event. and including 130 lobby visits uh, with congressional offices that were done virtually. So I'm so proud of our team for pulling that off, but it was about people willing to be bold and to step into um, a, a need. They were talking about putting a price on carbon to address climate change, but it could be on any issue. We are going to see new leaders emerge from this crisis and um, that is hopeful. Uh, but it is also hopeful that um, people who have devoted their lives to the pursuit of peace, to the pursuit of justice, to the pursuit of environmental stewardship, continue that um, day in and day out. So some of you are those people. And I just want to thank you for uh, journeying with FCNL, uh, for continuing to support the organization, uh, especially at this time as we continue working even in a remote way. And I wanna invite you to uh, join us again in two weeks. We'll send out more information. Um, uh, if you feel like you're getting a lot of email from FCNL, um, please just share it with others. Don't delete it. It is the way that we can stay in touch with you the best because we won't be traveling a lot. Um, so we won't be seeing you in person, but we do wanna stay in touch with you. And we do encourage you to reach back out to us if you have specific questions or ideas. And, um, as I said before, the website has a lot of great information about um, all of these issues that Amelia has talked about and how to take action. And we're trying to consistently update it 
on a regular basis at fcnl.org. So please uh, come to that and, um, and stay connected to us. And with that, uh, I wish those of you who may be celebrating Passover um, a joyous Passover, those of you who are celebrating Easter to have a joyous Easter. And if you're celebrating spring, um, enjoy that. At least where we are, it is, it is glorious, uh, despite uh, the hardship of now at this time. So thank you.